Um, my name is Alex Andreu. Um, I am from Greece originally. I have been in this country for ooh, 25 years now. I have worked as a lawyer and I work as an actor and a writer, so that's my little introduction. Um, can I ask for a show of hands around the room? Um, which of you would define yourselves as expats? Let's go with expats. Good, a few hands. Um, which of you would define yourselves as migrants? How about immigrants? Okay. Um, which of you live more than three hours travel from the place you were born? Ah, that's a lot of hands, isn't it? Um, so what is it that makes you different to me? And what is it that makes you um, alike me? I'm sorry to shock you. Um, but this is what's going on in the UK at the moment. Um, a couple of Spanish tourists were attacked this week in uh, the center of York. Um, they were chased and beaten for a full 10 minutes, um, went to uh, A&E with incredibly serious injuries. They were Spanish and they were tourists. They were visiting the city voted the safest in the world only a month ago. And they were beaten for being foreigners by a group um, shouting xenophobic abuse to them. Um, what has happened? What has changed recently? I think anyone from a different country that's been here for a number of years will have noticed the change in the last few. I certainly have. Um, for the first time, I've been shouted at in the street repeatedly. Um, for the first time, I have felt as if I need to justify myself, as if I'm undesirable. For the first time, I've actually considered leaving this country. For the very first time. Um, this is very much my home. I see it as my home. I traveled extensively um, before I chose this place as my home. I have family in four or five different countries, depending on the time of year. Um, so I consider myself very much a person of multiple identities. I'm Greek. I'm also a bit British. I'm also a bit European. Um, and so what has changed? I could go on to deconstruct myths about migrants. Um, but they are about perception. About two months ago, I was called an elitist fact slinger on Twitter for, for confronting someone with facts about immigration that differed from, from their perception. Um, I carry that tag quite proudly. <laughs> <laughs> But my point is that when it comes to issues which we perceive emotionally primarily, when it comes to stuff that sort of speaks straight to the back of our lizard brain, um, actually battering people with, um, you know, the contribution immigrants make, um, or, you know, the real numbers of asylum seekers, all of that stuff, is relatively ineffective. What we're doing is essentially confirming each other's confirmation bias. <laughs> you know, they go away from the uh, uh, conversation considering a gobby foreigner um, without whom this country would be better. And I go away from the conversation thinking, what a bigot. And no one advances. Um, the King's College London did a, a study with Ipsos Mori, and I'm reading because I want to get these right, because actually accuracy does matter. Um, so they did a study comparing people's perception of certain issues in contrast with the reality of certain issues. So here's some um, of the outcomes for you. People believe this country spends more on foreign aid than pensions. 
Okay? The majority of people actually think that. Um, this country spends more than 10 times more on pensions than they do on foreign aid. Um, asked about uh, black, Asian, ethnic, and mixed minorities, people said that they thought they formed roughly 30% of the country. Um, the real number is 14%. Asked about Muslims, people thought they were 24% of the population. They're actually 5%. Asked about immigrants, the average perception was that immigrants are 31% of the population. The real number is 13. You confront people with that, and you get into a bidding war where they doubt the survey. They doubt your sources. They say a lot of immigration is hidden. You know, they will find whatever argument um, knocks down a fact with no counterfact to offer an, or of their own, with no you know, uh, different data to say, no, actually, it is closer to 30%, and here is why, because they're supporting an emotional belief. And so if you're going to counteract that, you have to target that. You have to target people's hearts um, on an issue that's based on their hearts. You can't simply speak to their intellect. Um, the, the reason I've got this up is because if you look directly at it, you could swear the dots are white. If you look a little bit away, you could swear the ones on the edges are black. So why are migrants such an easy group to pick on when it comes to political expediency, to getting votes? Let me introduce you to my favorite thing in the world. No, actually, my favorite thing in the world is chocolate, but close. <laughs> Close second, the Overton window, um, which is probably the most important political concept that most people don't know about. It was, it was a theory articulated by a man called Joseph Overton, and what it says is that whether an idea gets traction, whether a political idea um, takes root with a public, does not depend actually on politicians, on the party, on their charisma, on anything like that. But it depends on whether it falls within this window of things that the public right now believe are sensible. And the window can move, so you can drag this line as it is from left to right, and the ideas can move and come towards the center and be considered possible. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, it works both ways, by the way. So, Think about marriage equality, for instance. It would have been considered unthinkable a mere 30, 40 years ago. Then it was seen as radical. Then it was, people began to see it as acceptable, and we reached a point where the majority sees it as sensible. Um, this may eventually move to popular, um, and by the way, that line extends the other way in exactly the same way. So things can pass through the Overton window and go the other way and be considered radical again. Um, for Russia is a good example of how it can go both ways. You know, if you looked at gay rights in Russia sort of 15 years ago, they would be moving broadly in that direction. And if you look at them now, they've kind of gone past it and gone towards the other way again. This is what creates the gulf. The idea that migrants are used to introduce new ideas. Migrants are a really easy way into really difficult policies because no one will defend them. And so they become a really easy little back door into areas where people would be really quite protective but for the fact you're talking about foreigners. Let me give you an example. Um, recently, a British politician suggested that people who are of HIV positive state, status coming to the UK cost the NHS X amount of money. This caused an uproar. But what you saw was over the next two or three days, a few papers, a few magazines carrying articles saying, well, let's not dismiss it altogether. He may have a point. Um, 
If this continues moving, you may find that by next year, all the mainstream parties, progressive or not, might be forced into a position of having a policy, of having an actual policy position on people that are HIV positive coming to this country. Now, is this a real problem? Of course it's not. The reason HIV positive people were chosen is because it blows several dog whistles, you know, about um, gay people, about Africans, about the purity of blood being contaminated by the, outside, the outsider, which is not, by the way, a, a new theme, I have to tell you. Um, it is a very old refrain. And so what you get is a problem that didn't really exist in people's consciousness 10 days ago, now being discussed as if it is an actual problem. The reason HIV positive status was chosen is because had they picked, let's say, dementia, the statistics would be entirely different, the majority of migrants being young and healthy. Um, had they chosen, uh, I don't know, diabetes, the statistics would have been entirely different. They choose HIV positive status because it is um, a condition, the cases of which are on a downward slope in the UK, but where you get the statistics inflated because it is a UK government policy to take in asylum seekers women who have, been, who have had HIV positive status transmitted to them by being raped in war zones in sub-Saharan Africa. So that, that really is quite a cynical thing to do. So why would you do it? Is it about victimizing immigrants? My suggestion is that it's not. What it is is about opening a very useful debate on the NHS. You see, if they can get you to accept that health is somehow a zero-sum game with losers and winners, that the sixth richest country in the world can't afford a healthy population, and therefore it is a competitive situation in which you're competing for health care with someone who is less worthy than you, if they can get you to accept that some patients are worthier of treatment than other patients, that opens all sorts of doors for the NHS, doesn't it? Because once you end up with a hospital that has a tariff and a till, it's got a tariff and a till for everyone, my friends. So there are many, many examples of this, many examples where immigration is used as a backdoor to policy. EU membership is a classic one. Um, higher education fees, it, it is almost a carbon copy um, of what's going on in the NHS now. You, you introduce universities that begin to charge different fees depending on where you come from, and you end up with universities with a tariff and a till. And now everyone is paying 9,000 um, pounds. Housing is another one. Why would you accept that you have failed miserably, uh, successive governments have failed miserably to build enough housing when it's much easier, it's much more politically expedient to blame it all on people that are coming in? Regardless of the fact that there's almost as many people going out, we're not gonna, it reminds me of a joke I heard the other day where someone said, I don't get what the fuss about immigration is. You know, um, all my neighbors are English, all the kids in the school are English, all the shops are run by English people. I love it here in Spain. <laughs> <laughs> there is something to that though, isn't there? You know, when you were putting your hands up at the start, we're all foreigners somewhere, you know. Um, Bertolt Brecht wrote a, a play called The Jewish Wife, and she has this fantastic monologue in which she says to her German husband, years ago you said some people deserve insulin and some not, and I agreed, but now they've made new categories of that sort, and I'm not in them. More the fool me. That is the danger, isn't it? 
So, what do we do? Um, this is the bit of my, my uh, talk that has changed significantly over the last couple of days, so I'll ask you to bear with me. Because um, a couple of days ago, this campaign, this fantastic campaign was um, uh, launched. These I am an immigrant positive posters. Um, so I decided to include them. So that changed it. And then actually 24 hours later, I found myself being quite annoyed with them. So that changed it. Uh, I'm not for a moment suggesting that a positive campaign like this is not great, it's not needed, and it's not targeted to an audience where it will have an effect. But I'm thinking this. In my introduction to this speech, I told you immediately that I was from the European Union, that I had been in this country for many years, that I work and I pay tax, that I'm a valuable member of society. I justified myself. I am on the back foot from the word go. I feel like I have to justify my existence. And so, while also looking at the things that need to change externally, we must also look at the things that need to change internally, which are simpler but more difficult. And so what needs to change internally? I think we need to stop apologizing for ourselves. I think we need to start organizing. I think we need to start writing to our local MPs and MEPs and saying, I know I can't vote in the general election, so do you feel you represent me or don't you? I think these things need to be clarified. Um, Beethoven once said, in a very different setting, that he met this prince. And although the, the circumstances are very different, I think the sentiment applies. And he said to him, you are what you are by accident of birth. I am what I am by myself. And I think there is something to that, isn't there? Um, all the people who are far from home, whether you're British or not. Um, I have a friend, a very good friend from Newcastle, um, and her father has Alzheimer's. My mother has Alzheimer's, so I've had to bankrupt myself sort of flying back and forth so I can look after her with my sisters. And the person that understands me the most is this British friend of mine whose father is in Newcastle, and she has to constantly do the same. We have to find common threads. We have to make common cause. We have to talk to each other with love and with openness. And we have to identify very shrewdly who is it that sets us against each other, what they have to gain, and how do we stop them together. Thank you. <laughs>